Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. About、uh, three thousand eight hundred ninety tigers, more or less. Yeah, three to less than four thousand in the wild.、Yeah. What can they teach us? So that's essentially where white tigers come from. They're a recessive、um, gene. They're very, very rare. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. <laughs> <laughs> What's <was> that? <laughs> oh my gosh, we're going back to episode five, Angie. When you did that for leopards, Chris, I'm chuffing because I'm happy to see you and talk、oh, to you. Oh, this this episode, I I mean, I, we say this every week. I say the same thing every week, but this is a big one. This is a big one. We've been playing in the works for a while. Chris, I have to say, I have hit an Angie All Creatures podcast record for my own self.、Mm-hmm. Not that anybody cares,、yes. but I care. No,、uh, this is my longest show notes PowerPoint that I made. <laughs> <laughs> so, I that, think it's with, like twenty five or twenty six slides. So, oh, I have thirty nine. So, <laughs> okay, there you go, there you go. Whoa, this evolution's going to be long, huh? Yikes! Yeah, is, this is a two parter, folks. We. We have decided we we started this with gorillas and now we're going to continue it with tigers today. We're going to do two parts because these iconic species that are so popular, we want to do them justice. So I guarantee you we're going to return to rhinos, we're going to return to elephants and some of your other favorites at some point in the future. But we've been waiting to do tigers for a long time, and we finally got approval. We mentioned this last week with with elephant seals that the interview that Angie conducted. With a World Wildlife Fund scientist, you know you can go into it a little bit. Tiger、Angie. expert,、mm-hmm. yes, yes, that's in the in field. Indonesia, yes,、mm-hmm. you spoke to him when he was in Java, right? He was in Java, and you were in Florida. Yes, yes, it was.、Uh, it's pretty incredible technology. We had a few hiccups with uh, uh, our technological gear getting it going, but but my guest stuck with me and believes in what we're doing. And spreading the message at All Creatures Podcast, and I, of course, was am excited to share with everyone this week my conservation tiger hero of the week. So, yes, yes, yay! Lots. Yes. It's going to be. It's it's a great week. Yeah, it was a great week, and it, it was it was a great interview to listen to, and we're really excited, and we'll be pushing that out this Thursday. So, just you know, again, bringing this back up from from last week that. You know, Angie and I consider you our conservation heroes, and you're still sharing stuff on Instagram. You know, we're going to be a lot more active on Instagram now. Our Facebook page, we're going to be doing a Facebook group here pretty quick, where we can discuss this more in detail because the page is limiting. We can't really form discussions. So, if you want to join us in our Facebook group, you can do that. It's all creatures group、uh, linked off our Facebook. Follow us on Instagram, but. Thank you for sharing. It, it, it's great to see that. It's great to see people enjoying the content that we're putting out there. And you know, again, we just really believe in in this message, this conservation message. And this week's huge, Angie. I mean, huge. Next two weeks, huge conservation. Well, and that's why I joked about how many slides it took for me to prepare this podcast. But Chris, preparing for this, there's just such a story that needs to be told about tigers. I mean, they're The largest cat species in the world, the third largest carnivore on land, only succeeded by the polar bear and the brown bears.、Mm-hmm. And I don't care who you are, you have been captivated by a tiger sometime in your life, throughout history. I mean,、mm-hmm. it's just it's some of it's like the most fearsome predator on earth, but also the most loved and adored and A lot of us live with our tiny tigers in our house, our yes. domestic cat. Yes, <laughs> so、yes. a lot of the behaviors I'll be going over today are going to be like, oh, I know that. Stick with、yeah. us, and you'll learn. You'll learn whether or not tigers purr like your like your、uh, your cat friends.、Yes. But it's just they touch your heart, and and there's just a lot to say. And their story is one of sadness. Their conservation story is one of sadness,、mm. but then also one of hope too. Yes,、um, for sure. 
and the different subspecies throughout the world. So we're going to tell you that story today and do our best to do this iconic, majestic, beautiful. I don't mm-hmm. think we have to spend too much time describing what a tiger no. looks like. We'll, no. we'll get into the weeds a little bit with the different subspecies, but I, it, we're not going to do them justice, but we're going to try and hopefully we're going to get you excited and also educated and informed and inspired to mm-hmm. act. Uh, yes. And there's a lot yes. of stuff. We'll give you lots of hints and helps of things you can do from, from your own home. You don't have to be over in Indonesia, like my guest expert that I interviewed mm-hmm. this week. There's a lot that uh, we all can do at All Creatures Podcast as a community. Yes. Yes. I know. It's it's like, you know, it's, it's the the news sounds dire, but it, we can act. There is time to act. You know, in 50 to 100 years, we won't be able to act. But now we can all act. Everybody listening can act and make a difference for tigers. So that's why we're just urging you to to share the knowledge and share a podcast. That help, helps us a lot. Now, you said your at-home cat. So I, I'm dedicating this episode to my little tiger who I've adopted. His name's Jay. And he is a fantastic orange tabby that is my little tiger. So I've been watching Jay these last few weeks and I'm like, we're doing you soon, bud. We're doing you soon. <laughs> so. Yes. And I, ha- I have to give a shout out to Phoenix and Bear Bear, my, uh, <laughs> my, my clan, my, uh, yes. what's a group of cats called? Domestic cats. I'm sure it has a funny name. It's, it's not a, <laughs> my feline no. herd. Yes, yes, yes. But, um, and then also shout out to Julie. She's been bugging me to do cat, this cat. She's been bugging me to do tigers. It's been her favorite forever. So, you know, she keeps, keeps saying, when are you going to do tigers? When are you going to do tigers? So shout out to her and, uh, Jay, my little tiger. He, he's out there. Just a great, great week to do that. You know, as Angie was saying, this is a favorite species of so many people. So many people, millions, if not billions, if you ask them one of their favorite animals, it, it's a tiger. It's just, and I've been up close. You've been up close and we're going to have a special guest here and later in the podcast that has worked mm-hmm. with them. One of our favorite friends to come on here. And they're just, Angie, would you think the first time you were across cage wire or, or you know, uh, in the back exhibit, when you were facing a tiger, I was like, I wasn't scared. I was more scared of Leo the lion behind me, whose head was enormous. But the tigers, I was just like, oh, I want to go in there and, and, and pet you. Not a good idea. Not a good Don't idea. Do not do, do it. No. But they're so beautiful. Oh. Yeah, I think I was struck by their beauty. Anybody who knows me knows I love zebras. So I'm a yeah. big fan of stripes. Um, I always thought that if I would have had a girl, a cool name would be uh, Rhea, which in Spanish <laughs> means stripes. <laughs> so, yes. but I had boys, so I didn't get that name. Two but boys. I love, you guys can still yeah, work I love, it. yeah, yeah. No, uh, well, we practice. Uh, but I, uh, I love I, just the pattern. So I remember the first time that I looked across at Molly uh, and, and what's her name? It was just the beauty, but then also the sheer size of the paws. And then of course mm-hmm. the pronounced face uh, was a little bit striking. I wouldn't say intimidating, of course, because mm-hmm. we were, uh, in a protected contact setting, but mm-hmm. definitely mesmerizing. And then just, of course, the noises and the, Oh, the sounds, the, that's the, the thing. The, 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 mo- sounds. the sounds and the movements oh. and then breathing and oh. they're lazy. So they don't really do much, <laughs> which no, is totally what no. big cats do. Everybody goes to Africa looking for lions or in uh, Asia looking for tigers. And if you mm-hmm. are lucky enough to see one, they're usually sleeping. So <laughs> It's, yeah, it's yeah. pretty much the same thing when they're under human care. Um, yeah. but, but just, just beautiful, beautiful, powerful yeah, pe- people, people at the zoos are always like, Oh, they're always sleeping and they're bored or whatever. And you're like, no, that's what they do. They sleep for 20 plus hours a day. You know, that's yeah. to conserve energy. They, they can't afford to move about. I mean, in, in, in a zoo setting or, or under human care setting, they can because they're fed so well, but in the wild, no. They've got to conserve that energy because they, they don't eat very often, which we're going to find right. out about in mm-hmm. part two. So next week, you know, tune in for that. Now, Angie, there are nine subspecies. We're going to kind of get into this a little bit once I get to evolution, but three are now extinct. So there's only six remaining, either endangered or critically endangered. So they're just, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad story, but there is hope as, as we talked about. There's a lot of hope for tigers. Now, here's a question I have for you, Angie. Are there more tigers in Texas, in the state of Texas, in the United States, than there are in the wild? 
Chris, that don't is answer. A, I know. No, it's a fascinating <laughs> question. It's a fascinating question. And I, I cannot yeah. wait for your answer. That's all yes. I'm going to say. So about stay that tuned one. to the end and I will give you the data because I've heard that multiple times. So have that I. There's more tigers. Mm-hmm. But recently as pets. I've heard to the contrary. Yeah. So that's why I know you yeah. did your research because that's what good doctors do. Yeah. So I'm yep. excited yep. to find out what the research says. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It was really interesting. And, and there, it's actually a debate, but I think I got down to it. And I think I have a good answer for everybody. But we'll get to that to, at, at the end. And of part one. I think the whole point of what Chris saying, wanting to talk about this in the dialogue about if there are more tigers living in Texas than there are, of course, in Asia. The reason this is interesting, and I want to give people food for thought if this is one of your first experiences learning and listening about tigers is almost 95% of tigers that are not in the wild, that live in captivity, are privately owned. And these private ownership is not in a, an accredited zoo setting. So not like the San Diego mm-hmm. Global Zoo, Disney's Animal mm-hmm. Kingdom, the Bronx Zoo, all the yeah. any accredited, well-monitored, well-regulated, well regulated, uh, really care about animal welfare, those kinds of things. So 95% are private ownership. And of course, there are private owners out there that probably take amazing care of them, but they're even more so are uh, abandoned a lot of times as they grow up and people realize, oh, wow, this was a not a good pet choice for me to have because they get Mm-mm. big and dangerous. And a lot of tigers then therefore are neglected or uh, left to fend on their own or people will usually end up calling rescues. So that to me is a a big problem with this question of are there more tigers in Texas than there are in the wild. Um, The accredited zoos and aquariums do a great job with them. And there's probably certain private owners that have really, really high standards of care. But Mm -hmm. most of the time, they're just too big and too dangerous and and require a lot of space and a lot of care that a private owner cannot offer them. So that's me being taking a very conservative approach on that. (laughs) Uh, It uh, it is uh, not being, yeah, not not lashing out at at certain places. But, you know, I do have a little bit of data in that Texas thing as far as like cost of you know, what, how much it costs to maintain these pets. And then one thing you didn't touch, touch upon is, is breeding programs. Yeah. Private ownership. Oh, great. We're saving tigers and they're just breeding them for, you know, like we talked about with a few weeks ago with Corbin and in our zoo episode, these private owners that breed them. And then you come take pictures with the, with the cubs and all that stuff. It's, it's not a controlled setting. You don't know what the genetics are. You don't know if you're breeding subspecies. So you're losing that, that pure lineage, right. which those animals have, as you're going to find out here pretty quick, have taken millions of years to be specialized in that mm-hmm. biome, you know, and then the whole trouble of releasing a predator in the wild is, is incredibly difficult in the training and stuff. So it, it's, it's right. Not a good just thing. ask yourself, so we'll just all right. It, okay. It's, <laughs> I'm taking a picture with it right now. What's going to happen to it in two or three years when it's a full grown adult? And most of the time yeah. you, you're not going to yeah. want to know the answer to that. So. Yeah. Stick stick with accredited zoos and aquariums and yeah. tiger or or yeah. even better still tigers in the wild. Let's keep them there where they belong yes. and let's help out organizations yes. that are yes. are fighting that good fight and we will help give yeah. you some cliff yeah. notes on who is doing that. No, it's good and I was just going to say don't ever take a picture of a lion in South Africa with a lion because those cubs end up at game ranches to be shot. And they're so used to humans, they like walk right up to them and, and the hunters shoot them. So it's it's horrific. It's horrific. But let's let's get it well, happening. Yes, what take selfies like? with your cat at home. <laughs> yes. Take I will do Foss, that. Me and Jay go will take to your a local this humane week. society all the time. They're always looking for fo- kitten fosters where you just have them for a week or two until yes, they're big yes. enough to be adopted out. Take a selfie with that. It's literally just as cute, maybe even cuter, in my opinion. I know. I should, you know what? I should go take a picture with Jay at like JC Penny. Yes. <laughs> you know, and they'll auction it off on our website. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Make, sure, me make sure you show us cute kitty pads, though. I love those 
<laughs> kitty pads yeah, on their I'll paws. The sparkly mm-hmm. photo. Uh, and I'll donate, I'll donate the money to whatever organization we have this week. Uh, it's great. All right. So what's a tiger look like? I mean, it's just a big kitty with, with stripes. Yes. Yeah. It, um, I mean, they, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's more. Tight. Yeah. I mean, reddish orange <laughs> coat with vertical black stripes. Right. Yep. Um, and then of course, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. some sub subspecies are going to have paler fur, almost a white belly, which is even more charming. And Chris, what's really cool too is tigers will have white spots on the back of their ears sometimes thought to function as their eyes to ward off potential attackers mm-hmm. from the rear. Or some researchers theorize that these tiger eyes on their ears might help a cub follow its mom through tall grass. Um, but even more fascinating, just like my zebras, my things with stripes with the rayas, uh, yeah. Yeah. no two tigers yes. have the same stripes. I know it's like a yeah. fingerprint, like a human fingerprint. Yep. And it's, yeah. uh, so unique to each individuals and it'll the range in color, like I said, from light brown to black and uh, they're not sy- symmetrical on both sides either. Mm-hmm. And if you shaved a tiger, what's her skin look like? Ooh, I love it. <laughs> we'll have to ask John. I'm sure he's shaved a little t- uh, tail before, uh, yeah. but it follows the striping pattern, correct? Yeah, I know. Isn't that crazy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, their stripes carry to the skin. Yeah, so that's pretty unique. Yeah. Yeah. The Siberian tiger is the largest tiger, or it's also the Ymir tiger. Some is referenced because of that region of, of Siberia. That's the largest cat in the world, Angie. I was, you know, I thought a male lion was the largest just because the one I saw up close and personal with this enormous head. And we had smaller tigers there, Bengal, I think they were, or um, yeah, I think it was the, or Sumatran tigers that were smaller. I thought I really thought a male lion was the largest cat on earth. I I just didn't realize the Siberian tigers are much bigger. I mean, just huge. They're huge, over seven hundred pounds, three hundred or three hundred ten kilo, kilograms. Can get twelve to almost thirteen feet long or four meters, and they stand four feet at the shoulder. That's enormous. It's a, it's it's a big it's boy. It's huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now the females are smaller, up to about you know one and a half times. And then I just said the Sumatran tigers are about, uh, they're the smallest of the bunch. So they're about half that size, which is crazy to think about that they range from that part of Siberia all the way down to Java, Sumatra, Indonesia. From so the snow capped mountains to the sweaty jungles. Yeah. Yeah. Tropical yeah. jungles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and they've evolved. Now we're going to talk about white tigers here in a little bit with our special guest when he comes on. Uh, when Angie walks into the other room and yells at him to come on the radio. So, <laughs> honey, <laughs> we'll you're have up. John. <laughs> this we'll is have a, John talk about that. This is really special though, because he, mm. I mean, he's, so he's a big cat guy. So at home, he's the kitty cat guy and I'm the dog. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously we both love mm-hmm. both, but yeah. we have favorites. I mean, how can you not? <laughs> <laughs> since how about the time you had like 10 cats outside and john was going crazy because you were feeding all the feral cats <laughs> but i do i love cats too but i'm more yeah. of a dog person and but and at the zoo he was the big cat carnivore guy and the lion and tiger keeper and i was mm. the hoof and horn zebra keeper and we met and fell in love mm. so <sighs> he uh and so goes the story and here we are but yeah. he loves to talk about tigers just because they are so iconic and he loves teaching his students about tigers and he even he really loves to share his knowledge about white tigers so i, I want to bring him on to kind of uh clear the air and basically educate people on what a white tiger is with its genetics and um mm-hmm, might mm-hmm, it might mm-hmm, for some people it might be shocking for other people maybe in the zoo industry they maybe already or uh, under, know a lot about tigers might know that uh, and right, he just loves right. them so much and so and, and he's worked with them so i have seen them but i've never worked with them on a day-to-day mm-hmm. intimate basis the way he has so he yeah no, he'll, he'll he'll give he's, insight, he's, yeah. he's actually excited normally i bring him on he's like oh man what time is it no. <laughs> <laughs> the hippo off is the best. Still well, the best. that one. He, so he, now I do have to say I'm the hoof and horn uh, lady, but his yeah. first love was hippos. That's what he did his yeah, okay. uh, 
research project on and uh, mm -hmm. after uh, after college, and that's what got him actually started mm -hmm. at Bush Gardens. So yes, his mm -hmm. hippos mm -hmm. is number one, but overall he's definitely more of the big cat tiger big cat, lion guy. Big cat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we we just said the, the the range. So you do have tigers in these riparian forests, woodlands usually near water or down in the tropical rainforest. So. You're looking from, used to be in Korea. I don't think there's any tigers left in Korea, but just north of that in Siberia, going down through China, Mongolia, down through Vietnam, Thailand, over to India. In India, Nepal, yeah. Nepal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then down into Indonesia with Sumatra. Uh, Bali tigers are now extinct, but they were there. So the researcher you're working on was working in which, which species? Sumatran. Yeah. So mm -hmm. really, really cool, cool insight. So yeah, they range there. And then you had the Caspian tiger, which was pretty far east over in Uzbekistan and that area, but now they're extinct. So, you know, we'll get to the numbers on, you know, what's left in the world and where they're at. Now, Angie, on, you know, well, on, things... on, on, on average, there's what, 3,500 tigers total? No, uh, 3,890 3, tigers, more or less. Yeah. Three to less 4, than 4,000 in the wild. Yeah. Yeah, in the wild left of the six subspecies, though. So we'll like, break that down. Think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. I know there's there's high schools out there with that many kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Easy. Yeah, the big ones. Yep. Yep. That I just mean, is it, so sad to me, Chris. Have a whole species of a the entire whole, species. All these six Iconic uh, subspecies you just mentioned. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's only f less than 4,000 left in the wild. So it's. But we're going to share some good news. Some of these yeah. populations are increasing and there's a lot of protection mm -hmm. going on so, and there's some really 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 cool uh movements to try mm -hmm. to uh dramatically increase this population so we're going to talk about that yeah in part in part two i've got an amazing study I, I cannot wait to share it it's an amazing study on why tigers should be in the wild so it's really good it's really good they're they're just you know, when you think about tigers, you know, again, another apex oh, that's, predator. Well, that's a good transition to why care. Yeah. 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 Sorry. So. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just, I have a water, uh, a lemon water, lemonade drink and coffee going on. I'm just, <laughs> I'm all over the place tonight. <laughs> Where's the wine? Yeah. <laughs> well, like wine I, and beer. And, yeah. That's when I get done. That's my new, that's kind of my new thing. Okay. When I get done with a podcast, I have a glass of wine yeah. to kind of tamper down my, my neurons yeah. that have been firing and, uh, kind of relax a yeah, little for bit a couple hours, and yeah. celebrate that yeah. we survived another one. You and me, we still, yeah, I know, I know, I know. We're still doing it. We still like each other. We're having fun. I know. People are actually <laughs> listening. Uh, so it's great. It's so fun. It is. It is. And, and, you know, it's tigers are just. So important to the ecosystem. Again, another apex predator, you know, keeping other animals in check. And, and again, that data I have is going to be really important. They're a keystone species. They, they keep things in check. I mean, I'm reading a lot of stuff from a lot of conservation organizations and scientists. So the big thing is what tigers do is they keep their prey in check, right? So when you protect the apex predator or introduce or reintroduce an apex predator, they have a huge effect on prey because the, the herbivores are having an enormous effect on the vegetation around streams, forests, croplands, things like that, that provide clean air, water, food, everything we need it for. So in essence, when we protect tigers, and I read this off, I think it was World Wildlife Fund or, or one of them. When we protect tigers, we're protecting ourselves. And Angie, that, it just goes back to the study, and I can't wait till we return to wolves. But the study out of Yellowstone, we can go more in depth in this study. But when wolves weren't there, the elk herds just blossomed and deer populations just exploded. So all the vegetation around the streams and rivers was swept away. So there, the river system totally changed. When they reintroduced the wolves, it kept the, those herds in check and the vegetation returned. So things like beavers, other species, all the microbes, think of all the, the aquatic creatures, you know, that, that live in that ecosystem, frogs, you know, other birds, they all came back because the vegetation came back. So when you maintain a healthy predator population, you're maintaining 
nature's balance and that it, they're critical. They're absolutely critical to the ecosystem. Oh, Chris, for sure. And it, it's worth repeating again, in case you missed it. Mm -hmm. When we protect tigers, we protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. When we protect tigers, we protect ourselves. I just think that is really huge. And just let that sink in mm -hmm. for a minute, because I know the first time I heard it was with the expert that I was speaking to. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just had to pause and stop him for a second because it was just so profound and bold and true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people understand that so many conservationist government agencies, multiple countries are working together internationally to try that have that really understand, okay, if we take care of these guys, we're taking care of ourselves too, right? Uh mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it, there's, there's definitely some hope. Uh, it's just, we need to get more people on board for sure. And, and just because tigers are in movies or in commercials or, uh, you know, you can get your picture taken one or my goodness, you can probably buy one on the internet. Don't do that. I don't know. I don't go to the mm -hmm. dark web, but don't do that. But that doesn't mean that there's a lot of them that at all. Uh, and those ones probably have really bad genetics, but it, it means that they're the wild counterparts need our protecting and we're going to touch on it in conservation too. But unfortunately a lot of the population is becoming crippled for uh, poaching because of this, of course, unfortunate, untrue belief that different parts of the tiger are medicinal. Uh, it's thought that the mm. humerus, so that's the upper leg bone, the big, the, biggest, strongest bone mm -hmm. in your body, for example, can treat uh, rheumatisms or that other diseases. And some think that if you consume tiger bone, that makes you strong and ferocious like the tiger. Uh, and so we got to do a lot to change that. And the younger people with social media uh, that listen to us internationally, especially over in Asia, Man, that's not cool. It's not cool. It's not cool mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. consume tiger bone. It is no. it it is not good for the animals. It doesn't work. It is old school. That's what the older generation did that didn't know any better. We need to be the younger new yeah. generation that knows better and knows that tiger poaching is unacceptable and it's going to wipe them out. Yeah. No, no, it's true. It's very true. And there, you know, again, uh, no scientific data to back up that bone, eating bone from any animal is going to heal you. None. Or make None. you stronger. And there's some good stuff in Eastern tough. medicine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, acupuncture is great. There's a lot of good stuff that, that we get from the Far East. But, you know, from, from our perspective here in the United States, it's just there's no benefit. There's none. Absolutely none. And if there was, there'd be a company out there producing it mass and making a lot of money. So, so going into tiger specifically, the scientific name is Panthera tigris. I love this so one. We, we <laughs> it's easy. Yeah, no, Panthera it's easy. tigris. <laughs> yes. Now there are nine subspecies, but as we've said in this podcast, scientists are now debating whether this is true because of genetic studies. Genetics is able to, to help us build these phylogenetic or family trees of these animals. So, Angie, I thought it would be really good, just to really quick, kind of talk about why there's a debate and what they're debating. You know, because a lot of times, you know, we talk about research, redoing it until you get consensus. So there is a lot of stuff I, going on. Really last quick, I, I, I use that line today. Yes. I was uh, one of the assays I was working on. Oh, yeah. Of course, it didn't work out. <laughs> And it wasn't, luckily it wasn't that long a one. It's, and it's one where I could yeah, redo, yeah. I basically re, could redo the gel. Uh, but yeah. yes, I was, uh, joking with my, my dear lab mate and said, well, that's why they call it research. <laughs> if it was just search, you don't have to do it once, but it's research. You got to keep redoing it. And she got a big giggle. She hadn't heard that one. And that one was actually taught to me by our, our dear friend, Dale Kelly. So thank you, Dale. He was yeah, one of my mentors yeah, yeah. when I first Dr. came Kelly, to yeah. the University of Florida, him yeah. and I, Ultrasounded a lot of mares together. 
<laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, uh, I I really cracked the whip on you too hard. <laughs> yeah, we had right. a lot of fun. <laughs> so this study is titled Species Inflation and Taxonomic Artifacts, a Critical Comment on Recent Trends in Mammalian Classification. So this was published in 2013, Mammalian Biology, and there was 15 scientists on this this uh, paper from all over the world. They they were all over mostly Europe, but there were some in Canada. What year was and, and it? Stuff. Uh, 2013, so just a okay. few years ago. And they were talking about how recently, and especially in their publications, there's a lot of scientists arguing raising subspecies to the species level, mm. you know, and it's there's this phylogenetic species concept that they've talked about. So they're using genetics to say, no, these species are actually related or no, this species is completely by itself. It's completely different. So that's why they're, I'm just trying to tell the listeners, that's why there's debate, you know, because these scientists are saying, and what they argue in this is they're using incomplete data sets on the genetics that they just go and look at a few, few genes compare them and say, oh, they're really close, so they must be related. Or no, they're completely different, so they must be a separate species. And they're saying that's not true, that there has to be really rigorous studies, many studies looking at this, not just one or two, before you can classify something as a subspecies or species. So that's where the confusion comes in. I hope I made that kind of a quick two minutes. Yeah, so basically you need to do research. You need to do it over and over in multiple different ways. Yes, before you can really make a good consistency, there has to be lots of evidence from lots of different sources. With that being said, Angie, there are nine subspecies, but the IUCN groups them in, in two. So they really kind of recognize two subgroups. Of the nine, Angie, three are extinct, part of the subgroup. So I'm going to kind of go through them real quick. So the Bengal tiger is found in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. Okay, that's a species that we have. The Malayan tiger is in South Thailand. The Indo-Chinese tiger is in Laos, Thailand, and Myanmar. Now, the Mm -hmm. South China tiger is extinct in the wild. They have not seen them in 20 years. But they're 73 under human care right now. Okay, so they're they're not extinct yet. And the Caspian tiger, part of this group, they are now extinct in the late 20th century. Turkey area, right? Yeah, from Turkey all the way to Central Asia, Uzbekistan, uh, that region. So that was one subgroup. The second one is really what what you were talking with your researcher down in the Indonesia area. So you you have the Sumatran tiger in Sumatra, Mm -hmm. and that's it, which is sad because the Javan tiger is now extinct. And that was went extinct in the 1980s. And the Bali tiger went extinct on the island of Bali in the 1950s. Okay, but just to, so three species wiped out in the last hundred, really 60, yes, 70 years. And uh, I don't think you mentioned though, from the first group, uh, the Siberian tiger. Oh, how did I miss that? Yeah. The, yeah. The Amur. So yeah, the Siberian tiger, the largest right, one on so, earth is doing actually, you know, it's doing okay. It's doing okay in, in Eastern Siberia. That's where they're at now. And so by these groups, what's the difference between the groups? I think wasn't that what you talked about with your researcher? He was kind of talking about the the tigers, not just size, but the ones that he was talking about the land bridge and how they went over. And I'll talk a little bit about the evolution and how they got isolated on these yeah, islands. Yeah, and there might, and obviously, like you said, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. But I think the Sumatran are genetically the most different than the other from the mm-hmm. the other five species, and potentially could be classified as its own species, but I guess isn't officially classified as its own species. Not yet. Not yet. So that's why the IUCN has them in two groups because they, they, you know, I think, I don't know if they did any genetic studies on the now extinct Bali tiger or the extinct Javan tiger, but they probably were pretty similar and they were isolated quite a while right. ago, which I'm about to jump in, into right Yay, now. The cat I'm putting tree. my evolution, evolution. <laughs> evolution seatbelt down folks. Click, click. Here it is. All right. All right. All right. So we, we've talked about cats. We talked about cats and leopards. We talked about cats with lions. Just to remind people, the cat family tree, there's eight lineages. So this is Panthera. So we're talking about in Panthera, you have our leopards. You have our snow leopards, which are their own separate uh, species off of that. You have your tigers. You have your lions. And you have your 
There's one more in Panthera that we haven't mentioned yet. Hmm. If you can think down Anna, our friend Anna that we mentioned last week down in Columbia. So we have the mighty Jacksonville football team. Jaguar. Jaguars. Yeah. Thank there you, you go. <laughs> it's been a long, it's been a long week, Chris. <laughs> All right. All right. So that's your Panthera. Those are your big cats. Okay. Then you have your bay cats, your, your caracals, ocelots, lynx, pumas, leopard cats, then our domestic kitty cats. Okay. So those are our eight major lines. Okay. Now, tigers. And the other cats all descended from the mycids. Okay. And this is a carnivore that, that lived over 62 million years ago. This gave rise to all the carnivores, especially the one we covered last week, which was surprising to us. That was related to mustelids and ursidae, which are bears and um, honey badgers and things like that. And that was the elephant seal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The elephant seal. Fun, fun, <laughs> funny episode. That was a, mm-hmm. that was. That was That's great. one of my new They're favorites. So, it was a good one. I know. Yeah, it was a they good were one. good. They were good. So this 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 carnivore emerged and then it eventually evolved into all the cats. And we've covered that before. Now tigers specifically diverged from a common ancestor from snow leopards. So tigers and snow leopards are pretty closely related. And that was about four million years ago. Okay, so you're talking wow. about Asia. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. That- I didn't realize it was that long ago. Jeez. Yeah. So 4 million years ago, snow leopards and our today's tigers came off. The Longden tiger is the, the common ancestor. Now they have found tigers, you know, up to the modern tigers about 2 million years ago. So the species that we know today. And basically they all came from Asia and, and that's where they're from. Now the Javan tiger is by far are the oldest species of tiger we know today. And that's the one that goes back to about 2 million years ago. And that's from fossils in China and Sumatra. So they eventually did go over the bridge because sea levels were low. So we covered this in Tasmanian devils. I remember we were talking just last week, not the tiger, not the Tasmanian tiger, but the Tasmanian devil. Yes. How they spread to Tasmania because the sea levels were low and they were able to wander over there. Then when sea levels came up, they got trapped there. Same thing for tigers that on all these islands in, in the Sumatra region. Did you know there was tigers in Japan? There used to be tigers in Japan a long time ago. Wow. No, yeah. I mean, I guess it makes <laughs> sense, but yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. Wow. Ago. Okay. Yeah. Long time yeah. I don't know ago. when they went extinct, but they went extinct a long time ago there. Now here's an interesting fact with evolution. Tigers share, you'll like this with your kitty cat, 95.6% of its genome with our domestic cats. So that's what I'm saying. If you, <laughs> if somebody, you know, because obviously none of, most likely none of our listeners would like think that they want to, you know, get a tiger, take a picture with a big tiger. No, but no, 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 if, no. if a family member does or a friend of a friend of a friend, just, Show them your own ferocious little kitten at home. Go to a local shelter. Mm-hmm. There's unfortunately still litter after litter after of yeah. kittens. Uh, yeah. and, and there you'll have your own tiny tiger. Because yeah, there you go. That's there a lot of that, similar DNA, Chris. Yeah. That's and crazy. they split, they split our domestic cats split from you now domestic cats were small cats that got captured and domesticated. Their lineage separated about 10.8 million years ago. Wow. So. Okay. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. In that spirit, Angie, I have had fun this week. Uh, my friend Julie and I are going back and forth on social media because she loves tigers. So I sent her this picture of the world's smallest wild cat. It is the most adorable thing you will ever see. It is. She's like, I want one. And I was like, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. They belong in the wild. That's where they belong. But, you know, and she joking back and forth with me. The rusty spotted cat, Angie, is the cutest, cutest thing I've ever I don't seen. I know this one. No. I know. I didn't either because you used to think it was the, the, the black footed cat, right? That was, they're in zoos under human care because they're in trouble and there's a, a mm-hmm. breeding program for them. This thing is, oh my gosh, Angie, I gotta, I gotta show you pictures. It weighs anywhere from one and a half to three and a half pounds. It is only about 14 to 19 inches in length. You can hold it in your hand. It is known, they call it the hummingbird of the cat family because it's so huh. tiny. 
and it's found in India and Sri Lanka. Like it's out there with the big cats. <laughs> oh, <laughs> poor buddy. Know, cats are leopards. stealthy though. It, yeah. I'm sure it does just fine. There's they're, oh, cats, it's so they cute. have their own territory. They do their own thing. I know. And these little things are vulnerable. So they're, you know, like all, a lot of animals in, in that region of the world are, are suffering from habitat loss. The rusty spotted cat is now my, my favorite species of animal. It's just the most adorable thing ever. It is so cute. It's so cute. Aww, I'll have to check it out. <laughs> yes. Speaking of cute cats, I think we should talk about white tigers. My husband is a cute cat. Yeah. Stand by. Yeah. I will right. go get him. Okay. All right. Welcome back to the the podcast. Uh, the other half of Angie, and that's John. Hey, John. How you doing? Good. How's it going, Chris? Dude, thanks. Thanks for coming back on. It's always great to to have you and get your experiences. And Angie did a great job explaining. Yes, hippos were your first love, but you're really a big <laughs> cat guy, right? <laughs> I, you know, it's it's tough to pick one thing that I love. Hippos are my first love. I am mm -hmm. a big cat guy, but I'm also a host stock guy. So, you know, there's there's yeah. a lot of stuff. But I I had the privilege and the honor of working with lots of big cats. So, absolutely, they, they, there's a special place in my heart for them. So, with that, which, what's your favorite species that you've worked with? A big cat. Favorite big cat species. Mm -hmm. Man, that's, that's tough. tough. They're all tough individuals. One. They all have their yeah. own personalities, but I will say that so many people, so many of the public out there, so many guests are just enthralled by tigers. So many of my yeah. students come in and yeah. say, Hey, I want to work with tigers. And, and I will say they are amazing. They are just as amazing yeah. Yeah. as everybody thinks they are. You know, they're just as incredible and captivating as everybody believes. You know, we are all captured by this amazing animal. And they are just as incredible to work at the at work with them as you think. Yeah, no, we talked about, you know, cause I've been up close with them in protected contact and they're just beautiful to look at the noises they make, which we're going to get to some of their vocalizations. Mm -hmm. It just, uh -huh. you gotta, I just fell in love. I was like, Oh my God, you're like the most amazing animal I've ever been besides elephants, be, you know, getting there, right, 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 right. Is, you know, my personal favorite. So uh, Angie said, you know, one of the things we wanted to talk about, and bring your expertise in is this issue with white tigers. Like everybody sees a white tiger. Now there are albinos right. out there. There are uh -huh. albino tigers, but the white tiger is not an albino. Correct. It is a genetic trait. And we both thought to bring you in because I'll be honest with you, John, the lecture I dreaded most giving every year was coat color genetics. I <laughs> dreaded that every year. I just, all the different genetics. So right. she said you'd be great to come on and you could explain it a lot better than I could. <laughs> you know, and, and I appreciate you, you bring it up because it's, it is absolutely one of my, uh, kind of hot, hot topic items, one of my triggers, mm -hmm. as it were. Um, my students know it and all my friends know it that white tigers, they just really set me off. And here's the deal. I've worked with mm -hmm. white tigers and, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're fantastic too. You know, they're fantastic because, they're really, really like a big dopey dog is really the ones mm -hmm. that I've worked with. They're just dopey animals. And I, I love them as individuals, but the, the uh, I put species in quotes uh, is not what you think it is. So yeah, the public sees white tigers. They're often mistaken for Siberian tigers. They are not. Siberian tigers are, are a different subspecies, the Amor tiger. Um, they're not albino, as you said. Mm -hmm. They are a a recessive, a double recessive gene. So essentially we're not going to get too much into genetics and I will not get into the coat genetics with you either yeah. because yeah, it's, <laughs> it, yeah, it gets, it gets a little crazy, but essentially if you think about blue eyes in humans, so, mm -hmm. uh, so I've got blue eyes, Angie has blue eyes. So blue mm -hmm. eyes are a recessive gene because of that. Both of our kids have blue eyes. We knew that both of uh, any mm -hmm. kids we had, would have blue eyes because they're recessive. It takes two blue eyed parents to have blue eyed kids. If you have brown eyes, you, the, the genes say you may have brown eyes that are dominant, but you could have an underlying blue gene in there. So two people mm -hmm. with brown eyes could produce a blue eyed child if they both have what's called recessive genes. So sort of mm -hmm. hidden genes, genes that don't, re, re, uh, don't present themselves until, um, until you have two of them together. So that's essentially where white tigers come from. They're a recessive 
um, gene, they're very, very rare. So they do occur in the wild, or, or I should say there, there were instances of them occurring in the wild, in the wilds of India, but they were very, very rare. Uh, and essentially all of the white tigers that you see in, in zoos anywhere, really even across the world, for the most part came from one individual. Mm. One, one single individual essentially is the top of the line for every white tiger you see. Oh, wow. And estimates are th uh, somewhere around 500 white tigers uh, mm. in existence right now in, again, that's just in zoos or, or managed care somewhere. Mm. So what does that mean? Essentially what happened is they found one white tiger. They found a white tiger cub uh, in the wild. Um, they actually, uh, this is in India. They killed his mom found a bunch of cubs. One of them was white, took them back, raised them up. And what they did is they wanted more white tigers. So they bred this one male. His name is Mohan. They bred him to a female who's an orange, a typical tiger. Didn't get any offspring that were white. Bred him again, no offspring that were white. Bred him again, no offspring that were white. So what they actually did is that third litter, they bred Mohan, the male, back to one of his daughters. And then when they did that, they actually got white tigers out of there. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. started to realize, okay, it's, it, they started to realize a little bit about lineages and line breeding and recessive genes. So that worked so well, they actually bred Mohan to his granddaughter to oh produce even more white tigers because they thought, oh, you know, Hey, this is a, a stronger representation of the, mm -hmm. of the white, white gene. And then mm -hmm. from there, the inbreeding, so the breeding of mm. animals that are related to each other, that that took off with white tigers. And so since then, every white tiger has come from that original white tiger. Now, they have done some other breeding. They brought other orange males in or females, and they bred them with some of the white tigers. You don't you don't initially get white tigers out of that pairing, but what you do is you you then breed inbreed again to get more white tigers. So inbreeding is a problem. Inbreeding of, mm -hmm. of, of anything is a problem. And what, what sort of problems do we see? Um, white tigers have a lot of significant issues. They have eye problems where they're a lot of times they're cross-eyed. Um, sometimes they have this sort of a, an issue that doesn't cause a lot of problems maybe for a wild tiger but not for a tiger that's in managed managed care but the tiger doesn't look very good you know so that's famous for some facilities that had their white tigers if they'd ever take a picture of them they'd have to fix their eyes you know in, <laughs> in sort of in post production yeah, to make them yeah, so they were yeah photoshop to make them look like they yeah. weren't weren't cross-eyed um yeah. you have bites and underbites that that don't match. They, so they would tend to drool a lot. They have teeth that are missing. Uh, those are some of the slight problems all the way up to the problems where they're born without organs. So they, I had, there were tigers that were uh, white tigers that were born without a pancreas. And so mm. from a digestive perspective, they couldn't digest their uh, food. So they had to be, they had to give, be given uh, supplements throughout their entire mm. lives. Some were stunted in growth. So they looked like, um, they they probably only got to maybe uh, a uh maybe about 100 pounds or so mm -hmm. so pretty small for a tiger mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. have all sorts of issues with medical issues and, and and issues with these animals but because the public loves this idea or loves this idea of white animals white tigers the breeding continues on now the breeding doesn't happen in uh accredited institutions or at least here in the United States, uh, AZA accredited institutions have decided that it's against the mission to continue to breed white tigers. Why? Because they are not a true subspecies by any any counts. And even though there were occasionally individuals in the wild, they do not represent a typical tiger. So essentially, mm -hmm. they don't hold much conservation value at all. Nothing against the individual tigers. Like I said, I worked with white tigers and they were fantastic individuals. But from a species conservation perspective, which is what we care about as, as AZA institutions, they don't hold much value.
So, yeah. you know, for me, yeah. it, it's just, and I, and I get it. People are in awe of things that are interesting and unique, but this animal is, is, is a fake animal. Essentially it, it is a human produced animal. And, mm-hmm. um, it, like I said, it doesn't hold a spot for, for conservation value at all. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, that, the, the, oh, it's, it's, it's a horrific story. Actually. I didn't, I did not know that, that that was the whole background on them. Yep. And, and especially one. again, yeah, it's, it's just, and at the time I can understand, you know, they were, they're basically playing around with genetics and I, and I get mm-hmm. it, but we know now, now we know how yeah. these animals came about and depending on the literature reader, you know, of course, you know, you get on your good old friend, Google and you get on Wikipedia that Wikipedia does not tell you the, the whole story, the there, truth, you know, this whole story. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and so people need to um, kind of understand it. And it's, it is, it's not surprising. Everyone is taken by tigers and more so by white mm-hmm. tigers. So I get that. But I hope once you learn the story behind them, you're a little less taken by them and more, you understand that they're essentially an artificial man-made, man-made creation, which you yeah. know, it, it it's it just is not what we need to be focusing on in order to preserve no. this amazing species. I mean, we have tigers that are critically endangered out there that mm-hmm. need preservation, that need help. We have um, great breeding programs in the United States that are trying to mm-hmm. at least maintain genetic diversity. Those those programs should be focused on the the true subspecies that are out there and not mm-hmm. these manufactured species. No, yeah. And I mean, we have so much more to learn too about them. Right. And I know, you know, some of the conservation agencies that we worked with working on training predators for eventual release. So it's not like, oh, we're just going to keep them under human care forever. The idea is to maintain a healthy subpopulation, mm-hmm. then train them to hunt and mm-hmm. survive in the wild and then release them in the wild. I right. mean, that's what we want. Yep. That's the ideal situation. So yep. preserve land so what, that they have, preserve the locations yeah. in the wild, and then, yeah. and then, you know, either breed up, maintain populations of the wild, or like you said, release, which is a tricky prospect. It's, it's, yeah. and that's one of the things that amazes me about these animals is that hunting skill. It is a tricky, mm-hmm. tricky skill to learn. Uh, mm-hmm. And it is often time more often than not, it is unsuccessful. So that's what makes them an, an amazing animal. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're incredible. So can you talk about like an average day that you, when you were working with tigers, I know we talked about this in in your favorite, other favorite species, the panda, you know, (laughs) (laughs) and doing that one. Thanks, Jesse, if he's listening, but you know, cause a lot of people at zoos in my experience walking around zoos and you always get to the tiger exhibit and everybody's like, where is he? Where is she? Oh, look, it's just laying down. You know, mm-hmm. can you kind of talk about the, the day-to-day care of them and then your observations with their behavior? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and like I said, they are just as impressive as you have, uh, as, as you imagine they are. Mm-hmm. The closer you get to them, the more impressive they are. And um, one of the interesting things that I like to talk about cats is that essentially a cat is a cat is a cat. And so mm-hmm. I, I've had the the luck the privilege of working with many of these species of cats, but there are similarities throughout all of them. And Mm -hmm. honestly, they track right back to your house cat at home. If you've got a house Mm -hmm. cat, you've seen cat behavior and Mm -hmm. the vast majority of cats are like your house cat. There are absolutely differences. There's individual personalities, there's differences in hunting styles. There's a lot of differences, but essentially you have a house cat all the way up to a tiger, very similar personalities. The one difference is the lion, which, you know, we've already, we've already talked a little bit about the lion, the Mm -hmm. only true social cat. uh, And I would, Mm -hmm. I would even classify your house cat in there as well, that the only true social cat is, is the lion. All the other cats are solitary, including your house cat, your house cat, you know, Mm -hmm. does not need you, does not care about you. (laughs) Would no, just as soon eat. eat you if if you fell asleep in front of it, right? So, you know, they're they're solitary animals, um, and and essentially the behavior is similar. You come home, your house cat, what's it doing? It's sleeping. When do they get up? They get mm-hmm. up to eat. You know, they get up to maybe play a little bit, but you know, somewhere along the lines of twenty hours a day, the cats are sleeping. And mm-hmm. the the question is why? Why? Because they can. Because they're the top predator. So the so the, the tigers are the top predator. They can sleep 20 hours a day. Nothing is going to bug them. 
except for maybe other tigers. Other than that, right. they don't get harassed. They also are saving energy and they're saving energy for what? The hunt. Again, hunts are extremely unsuccessful. So they have to save a lot of energy to expel it to hunt. If they're successful, they gorge themselves and then they sleep again for – if they gorge themselves, they'll sleep for days. So when you're mm -hmm. managing cats, when you're working with tigers uh, in, in a managed situation, it, it is you have to consider – how, what's their behavior? Well, their behavior is to sleep a lot and then they only come awake to eat. So luckily as the keeper, you're usually the one feeding them and they essentially do understand that and they get, they get used to that. Um, and, and again, I'll say for the record, uh, I've, I've worked in worked with several different tigers and several facilities, all protected contact as, as you said. So I don't go in with the mm -hmm. tigers. It's, um, for me personally, it's just not a safe situation. No, um, no, no. You know, you can work with animals. You can read animals. You can understand animals. <clears throat> you can form great partnerships and great bonds with animals. I'm not discounting that. But essentially, if something goes wrong, somebody has a bad day, either you or the tiger, things could go really badly very quickly. So always worked uh, what I consider or what, what we say is protected contact. I had a barrier between myself and the tiger at all times. And then safety was of the most importance. I had to understand exactly where tiger or tigers were at any one time and make sure every lock uh, was locked. Every door was locked between us. So that's the, that's the number one. But next is yeah. Getting to know the individuals, every single animal I've ever worked with, every tiger had its own personality fundamental motivations were yeah primarily the same they liked to sleep a lot and they liked food and they wanted they were interested in you because you brought food but some of them were completely different uh, or, or, or everyone was completely different some had completely mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. personalities night and day personalities and that's what i love about working with animals every individual animal is is different um some of my favorite you know there's, there's a big male that i work with his name is vajno and uh he had he never really worked around other males because most keepers are females, and so he wasn't used to being around males. So, and I'm not that big, I'm about six foot, but yeah. he's yeah. he when I met him, he was not happy to see me, he was not interested in um seeing me, getting to know me, hanging out. He was pretty ticked off that I was there, you know, and so right. for, for the first several months. I mean, I worked with him and I could work with him, but he wasn't happy with participating in anything that I had going on. You know, he would mostly yeah. hiss or he would slink away or he'd keep an eye on me. He would pay attention to where I was. He only wa he would he didn't want to turn his back to me because again, he's mm -hmm. he's a male and he doesn't want to put it turn his back to another male. But over time, you know, we would work together and I always worked a positive relationship with him and I always mm -hmm. I, I did bring him food. I br did bring him treats and I did create different, uh, great enrichments for him. And, you know, over time we cr got this pretty great bond together. Um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it, it's just a lot of fun when you work with the tiger for long enough or any animal long enough that you can actually see a change in personality. And, you know, I didn't, I, and I shouldn't say I changed his personality. I just got to know him and he got to know me and he understood that, I was no threat. And, you know, it's, it's a really cool thing to go from him being, you know, f fairly, um, standoffish, aloof slash annoyed with me to accepting me, coming up to me when I call, you know, all of that stuff is, is really pretty cool. When you, when you call, you know, I worked with, with in facilities that had long hallways where the cats go up and down these hallways to get either onto a habitat or into a back area. And you, you call down this hallway. And again, I'm on the other side of, an, of the fence, but I call down this hallway and, you know, kind of see him come trotting up towards me and not lunging or aggressing or throwing his paws around, but coming straight up to me to, to see me. And then, you know, sort of a vocal uh, greeting to me. It, it's just mm -hmm. a super cool mm -hmm. experience, you know? Oh, yeah. It's just, yeah. it's yeah. just, they're really, it's a really cool experience. Um, so I know the guests, you know, like, like you said, guests come up, they see them sleeping a lot and they can't find mm -hmm. them, which is part of their allure. They're a huge cat, mm -hmm. but yet they can blend into, to 
they're an orange and black cat, but they can blend into green grass because they're perfectly camouflaged. And that's one mm -hmm. of the really cool things about them. But as keepers, yeah, we get lucky because anytime we call, they perk up to see what we're doing and they perk up to yeah, see, yeah. you know, what we're up to. And so, um, for, for the cats, um, the way we work with them is like I said, we always respect them. It's always a positive relationship, but you always want to work and do things to try to increase those natural behaviors. So some of the coolest things that you can do with cats are the enrichment. So changing their day, changing the way they interact with things, giving them something to draw out those natural behaviors. That is some of the coolest thing you can do with them. So we would do things where um, their typical food, you know, people are like, well, what do they eat? Typically in a managed care situation in a zoo, they are eating a ground meat. It looks like hamburger. If I showed you, if I just showed you some of it, you'd think it was hamburger. Some of it is basically hamburger because ground beef. A lot of it is actually horse. So, you know, one of your, for you, one of you and Angie's favorite animals. I know, I know. They, they get fed out to the tigers and it's really kind of yeah, interesting. Yeah. That's its own discussion. That's a, that's a discussion for, mm -hmm. for another day as to, to yeah. how that happens and doesn't happen. But they found that, um, the horse meat tends to be less, um, cause less allergens. So, so your, your animals tend to be less allergic to horse meat than they are to beef. So a lot of the facilities go to feeding horse meat. Um, so they, that's primarily what we feed is, is a ground horse meat, but then you want to draw some of those natural instincts. So we will give them what we call whole prey or whole prey items or parts of whole prey items. So pieces of, um, cow like a cow leg bone or a shank bone or rib bones a rack of ribs sometimes we'd give them literally a, a rack of half half ribs um all with the connective tissue and why so they could actually rip and tear it up just it's amazing to see a tiger doing what it was built to do which is rip and tear and and yeah, pull, yeah, pull yeah, apart yeah, uh, they're, they're a meat you effective know? Yeah. exactly incredible and so some of the cool thing is giving them that but also giving that to them in, in different ways. Um, one of the best things we used to do is hang, we'd have bungee cords in a yard or in a, 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 a habitat or a back area where we'd have a bungee cord strung way up high and you attach some of this meat, like a, a rack of ribs on the end of a, end of a bungee cord. They'd have to, if you suspend it up high enough, they have to use that leaping ability, those powerful legs to, to, to leap and grab it, pull, and then it would actually fight back just like, mm -hmm. you know, in the wild, uh, uh, in the wild, yeah, an animal would fight back. So you get some really cool behaviors. You get some really excellent behaviors. And that was some of the, the best part is, um, working with those animals to get them some, draw some of those natural behaviors out of them. No, they're, yeah, they're amazing to watch. And, and you could talk about them all day. You oh, have done this yeah, I was going to say, I barely got, gave you an, a word in edgewise because they are, they're just, it's, it's such a blast to work with them. They're just so powerful and so incredible. And, yeah. I, and again, you get these animals that, um, can, you know, are on the top of the food chain and you yes, know, are yes. the, the alpha predators and, yeah. um, to be able to work in close proximity is, is it's practically, um, it's practically life changing. I mean, it really is, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and like I said, I get <clears throat> lots and lots of people who, who say this is their dream and that's what they want to do. And it's, it's pretty cool that I was able to do that for a while. And again, it's an honor and it's a privilege and, and every day I got to work with them was just, was a, was a great day. You know, it really was a great and, day. And the funny thing is you didn't talk this well about pandas. <laughs> <laughs> the prima donnas. I didn't. Of the I didn't talk quite as as uh, excessively about pandas. I, I did not. Why so, won't you, you know. eat this bamboo? Damn it! Right, because exactly, one is very picky in a prima donna, <laughs> and one is the top carnivore. And uh, Sorry, is, carnivore, yeah. you know, yeah. and again, and I'm not saying that they didn't have their moments, and they're not. Oh, I'm sure I'm stubborn. Sure. You know, and and they didn't. There are yeah. things that they didn't want to do. You know, and it's it's. um so it was always a challenge, but that's where working with the, working with the animals, creating a relationship mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. animals, that's what brings you through. And that's, that's why I loved 
my job. I still love my job, but yeah. it's, you know, I have a different yeah. role now, but that's why I love my job as a zookeeper because I got to work with the animals, create these relationships and that's right. what works you through, you know? And, and, uh, like I said, they're, they're solitary. Um, but frequently you go to zoos, you see them sometimes together or you do have several tigers at a zoo, but they're not together. So you have to work with that. You have to work them around each other, even though they typically don't want to be. And again, usually mm -hmm. it's, it's a one, you have one male, one female. Um, if you do have same sex animals at the same facility, sometimes it's a little more challenging to get them to work together or even. Oh yeah, each I'm other. sure. I'm sure. You know, even, I'm sure. uh, you know, it's easier. It tends to be easier with females getting the females together or near each other, mm -hmm. but sometimes that's, you know, sometimes that's not the case. Yeah. 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 I mean, solitary animals. So before I let you go, you have to give us some sounds. Uh -huh. yep. <laughs> We'd have to chuff off. Right. So I'm going to compare yours to, to Angie's way back in the leper episode. She said she's going to do it again. So nice. we'll get her to do it. But uh, let, let's hear your chuff. Well, so I'll just set it up. I don't know how much you guys talked about, but the, yeah. but the chuff is a, it's a tiger greeting. So again, when I talk about Vajno and this huge uh, male tiger, that for a long time was just ticked off with me, didn't want to be around me and just stayed away from me to, to flipping that to, like I said, coming up this hallway and, and greeting me and greeting me in the tiger way, greeting me with a chuff. It's just this coolest experience to, to, to see that and feel that. And again, I worked with lions and it's a completely different, obviously species, but, their mm -hmm. vocalizations, you know, when they roar and they've got that powerful roar that just shakes right, your body right, is yeah. one thing. But to be greeted by this tiger, this sweet tiger chuff, again, this top mm -hmm. predator, and they greet mm -hmm. each other so sweetly, it's it's just an incredible experience. So that's why the tiger chuff is one of my favorite uh, vocalizations. Yeah. And it's, yeah. yeah. It was fun teaching you know teaching the kids teaching the boys about vocalizations yeah. everybody does it with their kids like what does an elephant say and what is it you know when we get to tigers everybody wants to just roar i'm like no that's not what a tiger says this is yeah what i know says. i know yeah, this is what the yeah. tigers do so i yeah. i taught yeah. them to to chuff and it's a pretty sweet thing so here's here is your uh again here's your tiger chuff this is a, a friendly tiger greeting to each other <laughs> <laughs> You guys sound exactly like. Oh my god! It's because it's because I taught her to jump. That's why it sounds like. <laughs> you both sound exactly. I don't even want to. Oh my god! It's, you can't. You wouldn't be able to. You can't even figure out who who's the winner. But but I got it. Oh, I, you guys are I, the best. You two are the best. I, you know. <laughs> but experiencing that in in yeah, it's uh, amazing. up close is yeah. is just incredible. Um, oh, they make the most amazing noises. They're just, yeah. they're special. They're special. Yeah, animals. they're, they're, they all, great. all animals are, but these ones are great. Yeah, they're a great animal. They're fun to work with. I mean, they're all fun to work with, but they are an, an incredible just presence. Uh, and I, again, I can't stress enough as amazing as you think these animals are, they are and more. You know, they, they are the, all of that and more. And again, that's why we we have to think about these animals. We have to think about mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. are we gonna do? What are we gonna leave our children? You know, what are we gonna yeah, no. leave mm -hmm. our children? And here's the thing, you know, no, I've never seen a tiger in the wild. The chance of me seeing a mm -hmm. tiger in the wild, pretty rare anyways, because of you're talking elusive cats. Elusive, but yeah. you know, more and more because of what's going on with them. And I know you guys mm -hmm. you're gonna talk more and more about this and you got some great people that you're you're talking to that are doing some great things, mm -hmm. but as, as a society, we got to think about what's really important to us and what are we going to preserve right. and, yeah. and to let, to let slash cause, you know, one of the top predators in the entire earth go extinct on our watch is, yeah. is a sad, sad it's, state of affairs, you know? Yeah. It's unpalatable. It, it yep. can't happen. It can't happen. Yep. And it's it not going happen. to, we're going to fight. We're going to fight but, hard. Yeah, exactly. But you know, yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite cats by far, um, yeah, just an impressive, impressive animal. And, you know, I get asked all the time, like, oh, do you miss it? Do you, you know, do you miss working with, mm -hmm. with animals? And of course I do. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, those are some of the animals I think about, I, you know, I think about hippos certainly. And I think about mm -hmm. the times that I got to work with tigers and, you know, and, and, um, yeah, I, I miss that a lot. But like I said, I, hopefully, hopefully I have 
that the future of, of zookeeping is in is in good hands with the next generation mm-hmm. and i'm i'm secure mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. that and i'm good with what yeah. you know my role is now but you know it's upon it's 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 in all of our hands to do something and make sure that we're doing exactly. something about these animals and making sure they survive but um but yeah, yeah. but again incredible species incredible animal great individuals mm-hmm. um absolutely some of the best times of my life working with them. And so, yeah, I, I appreciate you guys letting me come on and yeah, and, no, thanks for coming and, on. I mean, yeah, it's amazing to, to hear you and, talk and yeah. And it's just your experience and, and your insight is, is always welcome. So thank you, John. And um, yeah, maybe just tell your wife, she can just watch TV and we'll finish this. Out. Yeah. We'll just do it ourselves. Absolutely. Like, I, I could, I get, as Never you could knows. tell, I could, I could talk about tigers. Uh, yeah. All day, all night. So yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. She's the she's the she's the comedy routine. So she is. We, that's, we need that's, her too. Yeah. She has that. Yeah. She has that in, in spades. So thanks, all for right. guys. Great job. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Take care. Right. <laughs> Go get, <grab> her. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. Welcome back, Angie. John was a special treat as always. It was great listening to your hubby talk about his love of tigers. It was great. It was really great. Oh, good, Chris. Did he do any chuffing noises for you? Yes. <laughs> I was dying laughing because it sounded exactly like you. I'm just like, oh, my gosh. I can only imagine your household. I mean, I've seen your household at night, but oh, my goodness. Oh, you guys are too special. Too special uh, people. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, Xander recently picked, it, picked out a book at the library that has – it's all about lions because he knew it's, his dad would like it. And they talk about lion roars in there. And so he has – all the, he has both boys doing lion roars and himself. And I'm just sitting there <laughs> shaking my head being like, man, there's a lot of testosterone in this house. <laughs> yes, there is. But watching, watching uh, little Zach do a lion roar is super cute. Yeah, so I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just send you a video. Please, please. So I think this is a good, good place to end uh, part one. Before you go, I just wanted to let you know the what I said earlier. Are there more tigers in Texas than in the wild? So what Angie said earlier, we're about, what, 3,800 tigers in the wild? That's World Wildlife Fund uh, numbers? Yes, and a population mm-hmm. overall decreasing. Okay. So I did this. I did many rabbit holes this week, but this was one I went down because I was really curious because I've heard that there was more tigers in Texas than there are in the wild. Now... There are no official counts of tigers in Texas because it is, and I will just preface this right up front. It is legal to own a tiger in Texas and in Florida as a pet. Okay. So it is legal, which need, I, in my opinion, needs to change, but there we are. Yeah. I'm, I, my blood is boiling as I'm no, no, sitting I here. I know. I know. I know. Okay. So there's a no official count of tigers in Texas or in Florida. Now the Humane Society estimates estimated there was over 3,000 tigers in Texas. So they came out and said there's more tigers in Texas than there is in the wild, which they don't have any data to back it up. They just said that. Now they based that on some like, you know, oh, these people had tigers and we rescued them. So if we extrapolated the data, there's about this many and Texas is a huge, huge state. The only census that was taken and which kind of shoots down this theory that there's more tigers in Texas than in the wild was taken in 2017. And they estimated there's about 2,300 tigers in the United States. How is this? These are not, yes, these are not as pets, not zoos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not as not. Yeah. These are, but even the number in accredited zoos is not that huge. No, it was way less. It was way less. Things like a, a, a couple hundred. Now, they do admit in this survey that big cat ownership's gone down in the last 20 years. You know, it's, well, that's good. It's dangerous. You know, it's dangerous and there's actually, um, you know, it's costly. So there was a rescuer and, and some of this, you know, I think this is where the humane society got their data. There was a sanctuary that had over 300 big cats at one time. Now this is in Texas. Now they have 36 tigers. Guess how much it, it costs them per year to maintain 36 tigers. Can you wild guess if you paid out of pocket expenses? Well, let me think about how much it costs to take care of a horse for a year and do a little bit of math. <laughs> Not even close. Not even close. <laughs> Not even close. Not okay. Even close. Um, for 36 tigers a year, um, $250,000, quarter million dollars. No, it, co- it, it costs them $1.2 million per year to operate. 
One point wow. two million dollars wow. to operate okay. thirty six tigers, so it is pricey. So again, when we go back to that episode a couple of weeks ago with Corbin Maxey talking about zoos and sanctuaries, nobody has that money just to to throw around every year to keep thirty six tigers or or some of these other species. So, anyways, so. Overall, the data shows that it's probably very untrue that there's more tigers in Texas than in the wild. Across the United States, probably pretty close to the wild population. Okay. Now, there are tigers held in private collections throughout the world. There's was about 90% of all tigers in the world are held privately. So uh, yeah, it's not just I, the United States. I read States. 95. It's yeah, throughout, 95%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Throughout the world. Most of the tigers are, are held as pets. So, I mean, even in China, they estimate there's over 5,000 tigers held in, in pr- private uh, sanctuaries. So, it's sad data, but, you know, it's good to, to, to bang that one out. So, anyways, that's part one, Angie. That was good. And we still have a lot to go. We still have a lot of information to cover. A lot of behavior. And you'll have to now, I didn't get to answer the, uh, the question whether or not do tigers purr. So, you'll have to stay tuned to part two to learn that tantalating tidbit and a lot of other fun things about behavior tiger reproduction nutrition Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, they're more mm -hmm. than meets the eye than just being a carnivore so we'll cover that as well yeah yeah and don't forget to listen to our interview on thursday world wildlife fun yeah scientist it is awesome and definitely keep in mind when we protect tigers we protect ourselves thank you everyone listen learn share Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.